Let's turn now to Romans chapter 10. And here in verse 15, Paul quotes from Isaiah, declaring how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So here Paul introduces the concept or idea of peace preaching the gospel. When he wrote to the Corinthians, Paul declared to them that God has chosen the foolishness of preaching as the instrument of bringing man to a saving faith. Now, I can imagine that Paul as he just sort of considered preaching per se, could see that a man of the world, in seeing the method that God has ordained, might say, well, that's foolishness. To try to persuade man by preaching. Yet that is the method that God has ordained. That through the foolishness of preaching, not the preaching of foolishness. And there's a big difference. But that through the foolishness of preaching, faith might be sparked in the hearts of the people that listen. An igniter to faith. Now, Paul said, We preach not ourselves, but Christ crucified. So preaching usually centers around Jesus and around the cross. He also said, for the preaching of the cross is to those that perish foolishness. When he was writing to Timothy, he said, preach the word. He commanded his disciples in Luke's gospel to go out and preach the kingdom of God. And again, we read of preaching peace. By Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ and the cross are the central elements of the preaching of the gospel. For it is by the cross of Jesus Christ that God has provided a righteous base for the forgiving of man's sins. Now man realizes that he is a sinner. Man realizes that he is helpless to do anything about his sin. And so the good news, the glad tidings of good things, is that God has done for us what we can't do for ourselves. And he has provided forgiveness of our sins whereby we can have them peace with God, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. God has provided the way by which we can have the forgiveness of our sins and thus fellowship with God. The glad tidings of good things. Now, the purpose of preaching is to spark faith, to bring a person to believe. And so there is always in the aspect of preaching the idea of persuasion, in persuading a man to believe. But God has chosen that through preaching, belief or faith might be sparked in the heart of the listener. And so Paul points out in verse 16 
though the gospel has been preached, people have been declared the glad tidings of good things, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Not all who hear the preaching of the gospel obey it. As Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? It is a mistake to think that everyone we preach to is going to believe. In fact, God commanded the prophets to go ahead and preach to them anyhow, even though they won't believe. And God has chosen that people should be preached to even though there will not be the response of faith in their heart. Now you might say, well, why should we preach to them if they're not going to believe? Well, number one, we don't know if they're going to believe or not until we have preached to them. And number two, God has ordained that they hear even though they are not going to believe, so that they are without excuse when they stand before God and cannot say, but how could I believe I never heard? So it is to leave man without an excuse. For he has the opportunity to believe, as the word of God has been preached to him. As I understand the teaching of Jesus as he was talking about the seed, the word of God falling upon the listeners, the people of the world, that there will be some that it just won't take at all. It's like seed falling on the wayside that is immediately eaten by the birds. And it doesn't penetrate, it does nothing. And then there will be those who will receive it eagerly at first, but really won't go any further. No depth. It's like seed falling on rocky soil where there is no depth of earth, and because there is no depth, the soil is warm, it germinate, the seed germinates rapidly, grows up quickly, but then withers and dies just as quickly because it has not really any depth to it. And then there are those where the Word of God will take root, it will grow, but then along with it, there will come thorns that will choke out the word that it doesn't bear fruit in the person's life. The cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire of other things choke out the word from their life and it becomes unfruitful, non-productive. But then there is that seed that falls on good soil and it brings forth some 30, some 60, some 100 full. Now, uh, according to this, and I don't think that it is right to make this assumption, but uh, according to this, there's one in four maybe where, this, where the preaching is going to take. We so often uh, hear... Critics of Billy Graham saying, well, you know, not all who go forward in a Billy Graham crusade uh, stick with it, you know. The follow-up. The number of people that continue is a small margin of those who believed. Well, if it's like Jesus said, if he gets one in four, that's pretty good. The types 
of soil upon which the word falls. Our job is to preach. The purpose of preaching is that the word itself might spark faith in the heart of the listener. To some, the preaching of Christ is foolishness. To others, it's a stumbling block. It's an offense. People are offended at the preaching of Jesus Christ. And to those, however, who are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. To those that believe, where preaching has really been affected, effective in bringing them faith, then it is God's power of salvation in their lives. For God has ordained that through the foolishness of preaching, men might come to a saving faith. In Hebrews 4.2, it said the word preached did not profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith. So the purpose of the preaching of the word is to spark faith. So he goes on to say, So then, faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. How can they believe in whom they have not heard? Going back to this original premise that Paul began with. You can't believe unless you've heard. So faith comes by hearing. And by the hearing of the word of God. That is why the preaching is the preaching of the word. That's why Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Man so often preaches his own ideas, his own concepts, his own philosophies, and seeks to persuade man to believe his philosophy to accept his philosophy. But we preach Christ. We preach the word of God. That through the preaching of the word, faith might be born in the hearts of people. And thus, preaching is effective. And it brings the changes. And it brings that person peace with God. And it becomes the instrument of salvation. We make a mistake in believing that our faith can be increased or helped by experiences. And there are many people today who are experience oriented. And they are going from place to place looking for an experience upon which to base their faith. Nowhere in the scripture are we encouraged to have faith in an experience. But faith in the word of God. Or faith in God. Who has been revealed in his word. Experiences can be exciting. They can be very moving. I do not deny the value of experience. But we are wrong to conclude that faith is, that experience is a faith builder. 
So many times we think if a person could just see a miracle, then surely they would believe. That was what the rich man in hell thought. As he said to Abraham, Look, please send Lazarus back to warn my brothers lest they also come to this horrible place. And Abraham said, They have the law and the prophets. If they will not believe them, neither will they believe, even if one should come back from the dead. Even if they would see such an outstanding miracle as a person returning from the dead, that in itself is not enough to create faith unto salvation. Though we oftentimes have that feeling, oh, if they could just see a miracle, surely they would believe if they could just see a miracle. But look at all of the miracles that Jesus performed. And yet they crucified him. I think of those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. As Jesus joined them incognito and walked with them on the road to Emmaus, rebuking them for their spiritual dullness, Oh, foolish and slow to believe. Hath not the Messiah, should he not accomplish all that was written in the scriptures concerning him? And he began with Moses and went through the prophets, showing all of those scriptures that pertained unto him. And when they arrived at eventide at Emmaus and Jesus acted as though he was going to continue down the road. They said, oh no, come on, tarry with us tonight, it's getting late. And so they went into the house and they broke bread. And no doubt, as Jesus broke the bread to hand it to them, it was probably then that they saw the prince in those hands. And their eyes were opened and they realized who it was. And he immediately disappeared. And they turned to each other and they said, Did not our hearts burn with us, with, within us on the way as he spoke to us the word? Preaching the word. That is the thing that sparks the faith. That's the thing that should bring to us the burning heart. The word of God. I do get worried and concerned about those people who seem to find the word of God uninteresting. Those people whose hearts do not burn as the result of the word of God. I think that it is a sign not of great spirituality, but the lack of true spirituality. When people get more excited over a vision or somebody's dream or somebody's revelation or somebody's utterance in tongues, or prophecy, and they get more excited over that than they do just the plain word of God. Now, I don't deny that having an angel come and sit at the foot of my bed and talk to me wouldn't be a very exciting experience. <laughs> but you know what? If I were in real trouble and in need, I would rather take God's promise to me, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I would rather take that than some 
angel sitting at the foot of my bed in glowing garments saying, Charles, <laughs> the Lord's going to supply your need for you. Oh, glory, glory, an angel told me. No, God told me. And I would take the word of God over the word of an angel. Because you know that fellow that we're dealing with is able to transform himself in, into an angel of light to deceive. And if some angel told me that, I might be wondering, who, you know, now, look, he was pretty bright and looked like light, you know. Was he the true or the, wow, you know. We have such a tendency to get our eyes onto experiences and off of the word. And that's very dangerous indeed. I cannot and dare not put faith in an experience. I know of a man who had a healing ministry and many people would come and be healed in his meetings and that was the chief emphasis of his meeting the healing lines and, and people being healed and one evening before the service as he was in prayer in the little room adjacent to the platform Suddenly the room where he was praying was sort of bathed in a light. And he looked around to see if someone had come in, opened the door to let the light in, or someone had flipped on the light, and no one had entered, the door was still shut, the light was still off, and yet there seemed to be just sort of a glow in the room. And, oh, he got so excited. The holy glow. And he said, I was certain that everyone that came forward that night for healing would surely be touched by God and healed because of this glorious light that filled the room as I prayed. And sure enough, when the healing line came, many, many marvelous healings. So the next night as he went into the room to pray before the service. He started praying, Lord, send your light. Oh, send your light, Lord. And he waited, but nothing happened. And he started getting desperate. Oh, Lord, send your light. Send your light to me, Lord. Still nothing happened. The song service started, but he was desperate. There was no light. He felt such darkness. He thought, surely no one will be touched tonight. And he continued praying through the song service, Lord, send your light. And finally it was time for him to preach and no light. And he went out there just defeated. And, and he was sure no one was going to be touched by God that night. And no one was. So he decided he better go into the room early the following afternoon to have more time for the light. And after a couple of hours of just praying and begging God to send the light, the Lord spoke to his heart and said, I didn't send it to begin with. You see, it's so easy for us to get our eyes off of the word and the promises of the word onto some experience and then put our faith in the experience rather than in the word of God. But then those experiences can change. And thus our faith can be dashed. Whereas if our faith is established in the word of God, then our faith is unwavering. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Lord, increase my faith. Oh, if I only had more faith. What we need is more of the word. 
For faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now, this in its immediate context is talking about that faith for salvation. That faith to believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins comes by the preaching of the word. For God has ordained that through preaching man should believe. And this faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. But, he said, I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Has every man heard the word of God? Paul says, yes, they have. Interesting, isn't it? How is it, Paul, that everyone has heard the word of God? He quotes from the 19th Psalm. Where David said, the heavens declare the glory of God, the earth showeth forth his handiwork, day unto day they utter their speech, night unto night their voice goeth forth, there is not a speech nor language where they have not been heard. Their sound is gone out to the end of the world. 19th Psalm. The sound of God's message to man, the word of God to man through nature. I cannot challenge the man who says, God speaks to me in nature. God will speak to all of us in nature if we're tuned in to listen. But so often, as Paul points out in the first chapter, Men foolishly misinterpret the message of nature. And they begin to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Last night, Larry Taylor gave me a beautiful book of bugs. By the Audubon Society. He knows how interested I am in all kinds of life form, all kinds of God's creation. And as I was leafing through this book this morning, looking at all of these fascinating bugs, (laughs) some of them with such spectacular design. Brilliant, glorious colorings. I thought, oh, how marvelous God is in his infinite design patterns, designing and adapting these bugs for the different environments to survive off of different types of eating habits to color some of them to blend in with their surroundings so that they are camouflaged from their predators designing some of them to hop some of them to fly some of them to crawl How wise, infinitely wise is God, the creator. And his handiwork was speaking to me this morning, making me appreciate him more and more. Man, if he looks at nature rationally, will know that there is a creator. To deny the creator is to look at nature irrationally and to worship and serve the creature more than the creator is irrational.
the man that does that is a fool. As the Bible said, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And as Paul said, when they get wrapped up in the creature rather than the creator, their foolish hearts have been darkened. So there are men who, though they hear the voice of God in nature, still do not believe, you see. Who hath believed our report, Isaiah said? To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? So Paul picks it up and said, Have they not heard? Oh, yes. Verily they have. Because the sound has gone out, the voice of nature has gone out and speaks universally, a universal language to man throughout all the world. But I say, Paul said, did Israel know? Did God give the message to Israel? And Paul says, first Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Now, Paul is pointing out that they did not all believe. Israel did not believe. As he writes to the Corinthians, he said, But the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And then the preaching of, cross, of the cross, he said, to the Greek is foolishness, and to the Jew it is a stumbling block. They did not believe. The preaching came to them. They refused to believe. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But hearing of the word of God does not automatically create faith. There are some that hear and believe. There are some that hear and don't believe. And the testimony of Israel was that they would not believe. As Isaiah said concerning Israel, who hath believed our report? And he was talking about the report of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, for the whole chapter, is about Jesus. Who hath believed our report? To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs. And we esteemed him not. For we saw him as he was smitten, smitten of God. But he was wounded for our transgressions. But he, he's, he's talking about Israel not believing. Who hath believed our report? Now Moses testified that the Gentiles would believe whereas the Jews did not. For Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. The Gentiles, and whether you like it or not, you're no people. And by a foolish nation I will provoke you. But Isaiah is very bold. And he saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he said, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people. So the fact that God's grace would be poured out upon the Gentiles who would believe the message of salvation, the gospel of grace, the good tidings of great things, the fact that the Gentiles would believe where the Jews would basically reject was something that has been spoken of by Moses and by Isaiah. As Moses testified of the fact that they, because you do not believe, then I will provoke, those to jeal you, know, provoke you to jealousy uh, by those who are no people, by a foolish nation, I'll provoke you. But Isaiah, even more bold, declares, I was found of them that sought me not and was made manifest unto them that asked not after me, the Gentile people. 
Does this mean that a Jew cannot be saved? Oh, no, no, no. It means that a Jew can be saved just as easily as a Gentile. But a Gentile can be saved too. That's what it's talking about. You see, the first church was Jewish. Strictly kosher. And they wanted to keep it that way. And they were really upset with Paul. Because he was telling the Gentiles, you can be saved without being kosher. And there were those that were disputing with Paul and saying, no, you can't be saved unless you are kosher. And that was a bone of contention in the early church. Josephus estimates that at the time that he wrote his history of the Jewish people, that at that time, he said, at least 50% of them believed in Jesus Christ. Now, when we read the 10th chapter here, and remember, chapters 9, 10, and 11 are, are grouped together with the one thought that for a period of time, the emphasis of God has gone from the Jew to the Gentile, and that during this period of time, the church would be comprised mainly of Gentiles. The Jews had had their opportunity and had rejected and so God is now going to gather in from among the Gentiles a body. And there are those who have mistakenly then declared God is through with the Jew. God is through with the nation of Israel. And they begin then to spiritualize those scriptures that refer to Israel and try to make them apply to the church and Nothing could be further from biblical truth. As Paul going into the 11th chapter shows us so clearly that God is not through with Israel, but is so bold to say that all Israel shall be saved. The day will come. However, at the present time, God declares of Israel, I have stretched forth my hands all day long unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Get this picture now in your mind. It's rather a pathetic picture of God standing with outstretched hands inviting man to know him, to love him, to follow him. The creator reaching out to his creation. What a pathetic sight. But that's Christianity and that's the revelation of Christianity. And that's why Christianity is unlike religion. For in every religious system, you have man reaching out for God. But starting with an earth base, trying to discover or reach God is futile. Christianity, here we see God pictured all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. The patience of God, the long-suffering of God, the pathos of the scene. As God stretches out his hand to man and man not responding to God. God is stretching out his hands to you tonight. God desires that you should know him. 
that you should love him, that you should come into a close, intimate fellowship with him. Some of you will believe and enter into that fullness that God wants you to experience in his love. And others of you will not believe but just go your careless way to destruction. Now, you cannot blame God for your destiny. No man can blame God for his destiny. You're responsible to respond to God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The word of God being preached. The purpose is to spark faith. Some believe, some don't. Some respond and are saved. Others refuse and are lost. But the preacher can do no more than preach the word of God. He cannot create that response of faith. That's something that happens within you. And you choose to believe or you choose not to believe. Interestingly enough, the choice is not an intellectual choice. In other words, if you choose not to believe, you do not make that choice on an intellectual basis. You may devise the reasons why you have chosen not to. But your choice was your choice. After you made your choice, then you developed your position. Why I have chosen not to believe. But it's just strictly a matter of choice. I choose to believe. I choose not to believe. When I've heard the word of God. So it's an awesome responsibility that rests upon the person who hears. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I hear God's word, I choose to believe it, and immediately the Spirit confirms in my heart the choice I've made. And God draws me unto himself. And he washes me and cleanses me from my sin. And I begin to experience the peace with God, fellowship with him, and that Awareness that my sins are forgiven. I choose not to believe. I go on in my restless state, searching, seeking, wandering through life aimlessly, wondering why I am here, where I am going, why it all happened anyhow. Your choice. An awesome choice. But you each must make it. Father, we thank you for the privilege of preaching the gospel. Of bringing glad tidings of good things unto men. We thank you, Lord, that your word has gone throughout the whole earth as you have spoken to man to na through nature but we thank you father that through the word of god there is even a clearer revelation but nature should have prepared our hearts for the fuller revelation of thy word and god tonight As the message has gone forth and has fallen upon the soil, I pray, Father, that you will have prepared that good soil that it might receive the word and bring forth fruit unto everlasting life. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. The Lord has been dealing with me of late, and I'm thankful for it. Sometimes we get careless in the things of the Spirit. And we have a tendency sometimes to just slack off. And the Lord's been dealing with me on this of late. That's why we are reemphasizing the men's prayer meeting on Saturday nights. Having begun in the Spirit, we must continue in the Spirit. We hope to see you men in prayer meeting on Saturday night. Starting next Thursday night, we want to start conducting afterglow services in the fellowship hall after the service. Times of just waiting upon God. Giving the word of God a chance to, you know, sort of work in us and responding to the word. And so... um, We're looking forward to just a real special work of God in our hearts as he prepares us for that glorious day when the trump of God shall sound and we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Jesus said concerning that day, Because the iniquity of the earth will abound, the love of many will wax cold. Jesus said to the church of Ephesus, I have this against thee, in that you have left your first love. And then the Lord even questioned, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? As we look around at the world conditions, as we look around at the way that the media is controlling the information and um, manipulating our minds, we realize that we're in a tough battle. We're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. It seems that the forces of darkness are wiser than the forces of good. It seems like if you look at the last 40 years of history, that Russia has made so many very wise moves. the Yalta Conference and all of the aid and all that she has received to develop this tremendous system, aid from the United States, which has seemed to make so many stupid moves. It was almost as though the Russians were running our foreign affairs department. And everything went to their benefit. And we think, how is it that those forces of evil are so wise and the forces of good seem to be so naive? I think it's because We've been trying to fight a spiritual battle on a fleshly battlefield using fleshly weapons, relying in our wisdom, relying in our military might, relying on the atom bombs, relying upon force. 
And yet the scripture said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God, through which we can pull down the strongholds of the enemy. Now, we must not criticize others for their mistakes when we are making the same mistakes ourselves. We must engage in this spiritual warfare, but we must also be wise to use spiritual weapons to fight the spiritual battle. Because if we don't, we're going to be defeated. <laughs> There's always, always a disadvantage of meeting an enemy on his own territory. Whenever I play Don McClure tennis, I like to play him down here <laughs> on my courts. That is the courts that I'm used to playing on. I can wax him. But he gets me out on his courts. And he gives me a bad time. I mean, he really makes me sweat. There's something about the home court advantage. Don't meet the enemy on his turf. God's given us spiritual weapons whereby we can and do have victory. But we've got to fight this spiritual battle in the spiritual arena and not be reduced to the flesh. So, put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand in these evil days and having done all stand in the power and in the name of Jesus Christ.